And I would define addiction today something like this. Anything or anyone that masters me or brings me under their control or its control other than God. That's how I would define yeah. addiction. Freaks, welcome back. It's week eight of Chasing Wisdom, part two. I'm here uh, with somebody by the name of Rick Newsom. And when I first came up with this idea to partner our messages with interviews with people that are older and wiser than me, you came to my mind because I began to think, you know, who are who are the some of the folks that God has kind of brought into my life who have a lot more experience than me? Uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about you, I've met you a few times, and I consider it an honor to get to sit here with you for a few minutes. We're talking about uh, addiction, and you know what, actually before we, before we get into addiction, um, maybe can I let you introduce yourself, maybe tell us about your family and what you've been up to sure. for the last 40 years or yeah. so? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to wave at you, and then I'm going to focus on your pastor. Um, it's been a privilege to be in this community. Columbus, Greater Columbus, since uh, really 1979. Okay. But I, I was able to hand select a certain woman out of Gehenna. Is that right? To be my wife. Come on. <laughs> a Lincoln Lion? A Lincoln Lion. Wow. Okay. That's right. Her name was Tammy Patterson. Now she's Tammy Newsom and okay. had a stint uh, in football. Okay. And, uh, and then after about five years of that, after college football, then I uh, was asked to go on the staff of Grace Polaris Church. Okay. Jim Custer. Big Grace, as they call it. Big Grace, yes. Okay. Um, and I, I think really the big of it, really, yeah. is that Pastor Jim, the elders, and the team there before I was there had committed to planting churches yeah. wherever. Yeah. And so it wasn't just big in size, it was big in heart for yeah. the community. So I got to be a part of that uh, starting in the, in the fall of 1980. I'd been okay. cut in football. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and I was asked, well, what do you want to do? Yeah. Uh, well, I'd like to provide for my family, wife, two kids at that point. Yeah. Uh, and Jim Custer said, well, I want to talk to you some, about something. So uh, here we are almost 40 years later okay. uh, with um, an amazing journey at Grace Polaris for 15 years and then at uh, Grace Powell uh, now for the last years up until now. 25 years. Yeah. And I'm just glad to serve and, and be a granddad. Three children. Three children. How many grandchildren? Eight grandchildren. Eight grandchildren. Yeah. Some here in Ohio. Been married for? 47 years. 47 years. I yeah. feel like I've been married about 4.7 years or something like that. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot more than me. Well, it goes fast, I will tell you. It's good. Kind of kind of a plug maybe for our network of churches, Big Grace. I think at one point with you planted Powell. And then since then, I think there's maybe 15 Grace Brethren, now Karis Fellowship Churches all over Columbus at it started back back then. So encounter and movement, these churches that, that some of us know, Three Creeks were a great, great, great grandkid of you and where you've been. So kind of well, a fun connection. It is a fun connection. Only God. Oh, that's exactly Only God. That's exactly right. Okay, so we're, we're talking about addiction. Proverbs 23, 20, and 21 says this, Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat. For gluttons and drunkards become poor, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. And, and I shared in the first part of this message that you really could replace the word wine or meat with, with a lot of different things. There's countless things uh, that we can become addicted to, things that we put on the throne of our hearts that kind of drives our behavior. There's probably a lot of, a, there's probably a lot of um, definitions of addiction. Uh, when you hear the word addiction, and you look back on your experience in life and into God's word, how would you even just start by defining addiction? For, the, for setting really the template of what we're about to talk about, uh, there, is, there is a time in my life 
um, that I know I was addicted. Hmm. Now, I'm, I'm going to define that biblically as far as I, what I understand. But I had, you have to come to a point where you know you're addicted before you know you're addicted. Now that sounds silly, but the reality is that I call it the hamster wheel. That, that once you're on it, you can't get off of it. Yeah. And part of the reason you can't get off of it is because there's something pleasurable in it. Yeah. There, there's a hook. Yeah. And that hook keeps you on the wheel. So for me, I was exposed to pornography in middle school as I was uh, cleaning out an apartment building. Uh, you know, just getting ready for new tenants and that type of thing. Yep. My dad had apartments and there's a stack of porn. So I take three magazines home. Um, I put the rest in the dumpster. Uh, so I should have put all the trash in the trash <laughs> yeah. compactor. But the reality was once I had those magazines and once my mind was was um, exposed to that, I found that I, I didn't need magazines. Yeah. There was an altering of my mind um, that had taken place through that visual. Yeah. But the visual also for a pre-adolescence and going into adolescence and, and all of that maturity, that also has a chemical component to that. And I look back on that time, and, and I would not have ever known this, but I would use a term, in fact, I would define addiction today something like this. Anything or anyone that masters me or brings me under their control or its control hmm. other than God. That's how I would define yeah. addiction. I didn't know I was mastered by sexual morality. Hmm. We have one who opposes us. He opposed the very first man and woman. Hmm. He continues to oppose and to exploit the very nature of man, hmm. male and female. And so in that exploitation, as an example, um, I, I would just say this, Joel. In the very first family, why did a son kill his brother? <laughs> Adam and Eve's son, Cain, killed Abel. Well, I would suggest that he was mastered. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, God told him in that time, he said, sin, Cain, is crouching at the door. Mm -hmm. Its desire for you, its desire for you, its desire is for you, but you must master it. Hmm. Now, we know the biblical story that Cain did not master his anger. Mm -hmm. So can anger be an addiction? Sure can. Yeah. Why? Because it has all of the components. It has an object. Yeah. It has a victim. Hmm. It has the idea that, um, that in that, I, in that case, I believe that God didn't accept him, I'm not accepted, so I'm an outcast, and with that, I have the right to express what I feel. It affects countenance, and anger also does a chemical dump in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's explosive, it ignites. Yeah. So when we're mastered by something, it's, it's holistic. It's not just one little area. It affects our whole being. That's yeah, what does. I feel. It does. Why, why do you think, Rick, you know, I think you'd have a hard time finding somebody who, if they're honest with themselves, says, nothing masters me. I'm addiction free. I think if we're honest, we've all got something that just kind of grasps at us in a way that other things don't. Mm -hmm. Why? Why, maybe, maybe just from a biblical perspective, explain to us why is it so easy for us to be so addicted to things so quickly? Well, I would just suggest that when Adam and Eve lost the battle yeah. in Genesis 3, yeah. and that was, again, a temptation, a, a deception for the woman to look, yeah. to desire, yeah. to give. Um, at the same time, Adam um, did not take the role, so he, instead of t 
taking the role of leader and standing between her and the serpent, Satan, he backed up and let her take the hit. Yeah. And in that process, when he abdicated his responsibility as the spiritual leader, and Eve didn't help by not turning to Adam and say, hey, what's, what? you told me this, yeah. the serpents told me that, they did not work as a team. Yeah. At that moment, they're in a position where they're fighting with each other while the enemy is setting them up for the fall. And as soon as they disobeyed God, they were under the very thing that the serpent said, oh, you can be like God. God like what? You are the one who makes decisions. Mm. You know what's best for your life rather than God knowing what's best for your life. Yeah. And the moment that happens and we play God, then we put the Bible or we put any authority that would say, suggest otherwise really to the um, disposition of that. It does, I'll do what I want to do. It feels good to me. It revs me up. It fires me up. And as far as I'm concerned, it's good. I don't see any consequences. And I don't think Adam and Eve saw the consequences. Right. If there's somebody who's watching or listening right mm -hmm. now who goes, I don't think I have, I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe I'm addicted to something, but I don't know what it is. Or maybe they're saying, I don't think I am addicted to anything right now. What would be some some ways or some questions that you would ask to help people identify things that we might be mastered by, maybe even subconsciously? Yeah. Great question, and I I have thought about that. I think we can be swayed, and we think, well, that's and I. You can just frankly Google addiction, and you know, come up with the ten ten things you don't think addict you. Right. But if you go back to the issue of mastery, what is it really that replaces God and where you would prefer and put that in a position over obeying God? Just that yeah. simple principle. Yeah. I do not know when I was back in middle school, I had prayed a prayer asking Jesus Christ to come in my life. I absolutely believe I meant that. Do I believe that there were some life changes? Yes, there were. But when you receive Christ at eight, and now you're, you're at 13, 14, 15, you really haven't done much that, hopefully, that would say you really need a savior. Yeah. When I came to that point, what I felt I had to do with my, uh, I wouldn't have called it an addiction, with my desires, I had to somehow find a way to master that. I had to find a way to overcome that. I had to, I had to find a way to be a good Christian. Hmm. And the moment that occurred, then it was this, this cycle of pleasure, guilt, shame. Pleasure, guilt, shame. And I was on my knees crying out to God. So Joel, frankly, was I saved? I believe so. But when something grips you and it takes away from you that sense of relationship with God, then we ought to pause and say, wait a minute. It doesn't make any difference if it's workaholic, alcoholic, sexaholic. You put whatever you want to in that slot. It is what can take you away from God and away from your confidence in Him. And then you move to a faithless faith that says, I've got to do something to overcome this. Hmm. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, that that's great. I, I think, okay. So let me let me take that. Let me ask a question on that. So you've got somebody who's going, man. I know what I'm addicted to. Mm -hmm. I'm right in the middle of that cycle: pleasure, guilt, shame. Pleasure, guilt, shame. I've tried everything <laughs> to overcome it. Yeah. I'm I'm where I was five years ago. I'm where I was ten years ago. How how do how do you encourage somebody who who sincerely wants to not be mastered by something but just right, can't seem right. to break those chains? Right. First of all, don't minimize sin. Sin is not something that we can control. That's why God said to Cain, "Sin yeah. is crouching at your door. It's desirous for you, but you must master it." Yeah. So that's number one. Okay. Number two is acknowledging that it is a systemic issue, not an external 
reaction to what has happened to me. Mm. We have to get away from blaming Eve or blaming Adam yeah. or b blaming Joel. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to blame my wife. She's going to blame me. Kids are going to blame us. We're going to blame the kids. Yeah. We have to end the blame game and take ownership for what's in us, not what's out here that we're saying is defiling us. Yeah. Now, what do you do then? Yeah. Let me tell a story very quickly if I can. Yeah, of course. Years ago, I was meeting with a, a man, um, and he um, came into my office, and I'd already talked to him on the phone, and he was doing some pretty perverse things that could send him to prison. And it was in, the, in, in a sexual area. Uh, I will say this just so to, to make sure we're clear. It wasn't something with children or that type of thing. It was just something that you would not imagine. And, and so I was absolutely sure this man was not a Christian. I mean, I had it locked in my mind. Yeah. So I, I talked to him, just the very thing that we were talking about. And I said, have you asked God to take this away? Yes. Have you, have you been on your knees crying out to God saying, take this away? Yes. I mean, he was emotional about it. And so God prompted me to go to James chapter 4. And these were the questions that I asked him that day, and I've been asking people this now since that time, including myself. And here it is. So what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Isn't the source your pleasures or desires that wage war in your members? You do not have, and you're quoting it, you do not have because you do not ask. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And I missed one line in that, Joel. It's very important. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, time out, time out. I'm not a murderer. Right. I know, you read that and you go, wait, I didn't kill anybody. So this doesn't, this apply, this doesn't to apply to me. Right. And he says, okay, but I have asked and I haven't received. And he says, the reason you haven't received is because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures, your desires. He looked at me and said, "What's? I mean, I'm going to lose my job, my family. Um, you know, I might go to jail. You know, and what do you mean it's wrong motives?" I said, "My friend, I don't know. All I know is you've said that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You've said that you've been down on your knees crying out to God for this to leave you, and you have said that God's not answering." And I'm taking you to a passage that says this is why he's not answering. Because you asked with wrong motives. You asked with wrong motives, or you haven't asked at all. Or you haven't asked at all. Yeah, I, I can do this myself. I'll overcome this myself. Yeah. I, I think when you when you share that passage, it immediately makes me think of Ephesians five, I believe. Don't get drunk on wine, mm -hmm. right? But instead be filled with the spirit. Again, we could replace wine with whatever. Video games. That's right. Anything that masters us. Anything that masters us. So that this this term it's kind of Christianese, -y, but instead be filled with the Spirit yep. or walk with the Spirit. So so in this, you know, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask with the right motives to be filled with the Spirit. What does it look like for God to act to answer that? Like, how? What can I expect if I ask God? And I'm praying, God, I need your help. Mm -hmm. I have the right motives. Right. I want to honor you with my body, my life, whatever. I don't want to right. be mastered by anything. Right. What does it look like for me to be filled with the Spirit and to walk with the Spirit? How can I know if it's actually happening? Great question. Jesus, when he left his disciples, he didn't just leave them. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. Yeah, he did. He promised that the Holy Spirit would do this for every believer and every unbeliever. Okay. He would convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So my response, first of all, if we're going to walk in the Spirit, we have to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the area because he'll put his finger on it. Yeah. And, and so the only way back, the, the only way off this wheel yeah. is to finally agree with the Spirit of God, this is sin and it's in me and it's not that person's fault my parents, my grandparents, my sister, my brother, my employer, my employees, it's me. It's 
me. There has to be an acknowledgement. I think we want to somehow dumb down the truth yeah. that we sin. Yeah. I'm going to say it even stronger. We're ashamed yeah. that Christ had to die for our sins. Yeah. Yeah. I am a sinner saved by grace. Yeah. Secondly, God, I've been grieving your Holy Spirit. It's right, it's right in the passage in the text. Yeah. Yeah. Third, I know that you are opposing me. That's why I can't get off the hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. It's not Satan. It's not, no, God, you are not letting me off this hamster wheel because my addiction is a symptom of a bigger issue. It's a heart issue. That's good. So when we acknowledge, okay, God, you're opposing me because I'm a proud man. I've tried to fix this every way I know. I'm a proud woman. I've tried to, I've tried to counsel. I've tried to do everything. I've tried to die, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then finally, he says, okay, now if you know all that, I want you to submit to God. Yeah. Well, what's that mean? Whatever you are told by the Holy Spirit to do, that is, and it will be biblical. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. yeah. It, it, almost, it almost seems like to me, you know, when I look at things in my life that I feel like I've been addicted to, even things right now, I want to prove to God that I can break out of it. God, you watch me. You be impressed. Check this out. And he's going, I, I oppose your lack of humility and mm -hmm. true acknowledgement of the sin in your heart. And step one of being free is to go, God, I cannot do this on my own. This is a deeper issue than I thought it was. Even if it seems like a small thing, in our minds, we can, like you were kind of explaining earlier, we can minimize it and go, it's because of this or because of that or everybody does it or whatever excuse we come up with. The humility and the honesty to go, no, this is a sin that's deep in me. It grieves the heart of God and I need help. Yeah. That's God. I, I, that's where it starts, right? Absolutely. And you said, um, I think, a, a really important thing that takes us really to Galatians. Yeah. The flesh will never defeat the flesh. Mm. It's, only a it's only adopting a new addiction. Yeah. It's good. I could keep going. I'm going to go to my final four. Uh, okay. Most, uh, these are like bang, bang, short answer. They may, they may have already gone to get breakfast. I right. don't know. <laughs> stay, stay with us here. These are good ones. Hey, what's the, what's the most underrated book of the Bible? What's, what's a book oh that doesn't get a lot of fanfare, but you're like, oh, but that's a good one. Wow. I'm going to say Jonah. Jonah. Okay. Because I believe that much of my life I was angry and didn't know it. Mm. And anger is a human emotion. It's not necessarily a sin. Yeah. But where it comes out is when somebody blocks my goal. Yeah. Or somebody's not fulfilling what I think they ought to do. Yeah. My anger may be silence. It may be walking away. But Jonah was an angry dude. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what he lost in his anger? Compassion for others. Yeah. yeah. Jonah got a lot of a lot of pub when we were young. But then they're yeah. kind of, when you're twelve and you're like, I don't know if it was really a fish. Right. Then we Yeah. We move on. It's good. Okay. Like that. Forty seven years of marriage. Yeah. We've got a lot of people in our church that have been married for like forty seven days. <laughs> uh, give it give us I know. It is great. And give us one uh, one nugget or one tip that would help us to have a fruitful and life giving marriage, life giving home. If I had a couple for one time, and that's all I had, and I knew that they were they were truly Christ followers, filled with the Holy Spirit, working on that daily, I would say serve one another. Go home to serve, leave serving. It's your role with each other, with the kids, with life is to serve. That's good. That's what you call for. As you look at people in their 20s and 30s now, Maybe you're hiring one. You're cons you're some one of them wants to marry one of your children, or I think all of your children are married. They are. But, but if you're looking at a young person who wants a promotion, wants to grow, wants an opportunity, what characteristic do you find rare and very attractive in a young person? Something that we could grow in to become 
to, to put ourselves ahead? I've mentioned the opposite of it, pride. Mm. We're taught as Americans to be proud of ourselves, and that, that's a different concept. Yeah. But I, I would say, I would use two words, brokenness and humility. Yeah. When a, when a man or woman becomes mature, or, or when I say are becoming mature, they understand something of what they're not. Yeah. And when I, obviously, when I was in that, that stage of life, I didn't see it. I mean, I couldn't see it. I didn't think I was a prideful person. I thought those were the guys with big mouths and, right. you right. know, right. just out there showing off. And I was sort of a quiet, behind the scenes guy. Yeah. I didn't know what was in my game. Yeah. So I think I, th I would use the word humility and I would use brokenness to the point that, hey, Pastor Joel, uh, I want to learn, uh, you know, I, what, what, what's God showing you in the years? And, and I would want to come under you and learn from you versus tell you what you don't know. Uh, last question. Um, in, I, I, I like the concept of this question. I'm trying to figure out how to ask it. but. When I say the word, a life well lived, in one or two sentences, what is that for you? Hmm. Um, I'll use a football analogy. Okay. Don't try to play somebody else's position. That's good. Play the position God's created you for. Yeah. Then the whole team wins. It's good. Okay. Well, guys, this has been week eight, part two with Rick. Uh, I hope you were encouraged by it. I know I was, and I hope uh, that maybe through it and because of it and as a response to it that you could go and walk in freedom, that you could walk in the Spirit. And you can. We serve a risen Savior. Yes, we do. <laughs> and he isn't just waiting for some grave yeah. stone. Right. He's, ra he's raising us up for the glory of God. Yeah. And I just want to encourage you, go for it. Yes. Go for it. And like you said, God goes in us, with us, and where we go. So, Three Creeks, I love you. Have a great rest of the week.